Welcome to the exciting rebirth of Superstar featuring choose your membership rate as low as just $3 a month. At Superstar, you get expanded exclusive video scopes each and every week, unlimited access to special horoscopes, class passes for Synchronicity University, consultations with me, and so much more. All of this in the Superstar space. I look forward to meeting you there. Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to your horoscope for the week of December 25th, 2022. I am your astrologer, Nadia Shaw. Thank you for being here. It is a remarkable astrological week, without a doubt, big moves happening in the sky now. And this is a very special time, but in a way, it's also not unique. This week will be reminiscent of what was happening right around this time last year. If you think back last year as we were finishing the year, a couple of key events were taking place. Mainly it had to do with the fact that Venus was retrograde. We ended the year on a Venus retrograde, but not only that, because Venus was traveling so slowly through December and into January, she was basically holding tight a conversation with Pluto the entire time. She was in the sky, hand in hand, with this symbol of being overpowered, being overcome. A symbol like Pluto represents intensity and it represents truth as well, but it's the truth that's found by really looking underneath the surface and being willing to acknowledge what it is that moves beyond just the dream and the fantasy and the hope and gets to the nitty gritty. It is about understanding the underbelly of a situation, a person, place, thing, and acknowledging where it is that perhaps it is not as beautiful as we had hoped, but it has its own beauty and its imperfection nonetheless. And so that was a sacred lesson that a lot of us were ending last year with and entering a brand new year with. Now, contrast that with what's happening right now. And what we have is Pluto hand in hand with Venus at the very end of the week. Again, very reminiscent of last year, but this time Venus is direct. But what happens this week on Thursday is that Mercury goes retrograde in the same sign that Venus is in, the sign of Capricorn. And so I find these energies rather fascinating. It is this week that we are going to have Mercury retrograde begin. Here we are once again, officially speaking, and we're finishing a year as well. Uh, one of the key characteristics of the upcoming and present Mercury retrogrades are going to be the fact that Mercury is retrograding in Earth signs. And Earth signs are about practicality. It's about what you are manifesting and getting really honest with yourself about that. This week, it really is about how Venus and Mercury are operating. They're connecting in the sky, yes, but in many ways, this is about connecting mind and heart. It is Mercury that represents what we're thinking about, what we're talking about, how we are intellectualizing. And Venus, of course, has to do with heart and love and self-love and how we are attracting, what we believe we are worthy of attracting. I find it fascinating that uh, with a week like this, we approach and begin the week moving towards an energy that is so fantastical. It is so idealistic. It's about being very swept up in a moment and swept up off your feet. But we are approaching a new year with a different energy, an energy of understanding more deeply, an energy of consequence, an energy that says we can't get away from the truth. Even if we don't want to acknowledge the truth, there it is. And the truth changes everything, even if it's hard to accept. And so with Venus and Mercury so active now, it's interesting to consider how these energies are conceptualized by the ancients as mythological deities, gods even, right? And I'm thinking about them at their root of Greek mythology. 
And so it is Mercury that was often depicted as androgynous and ageless even as well. He symbolized an eternal youthfulness. And he had this ability to move between different realms and different worlds. And of course, we know him as messenger of the gods. So he was able to transport and deliver messages where otherwise they would not go. And it was Mercury through flight and through his ability to travel that represented a principle of freedom. Now, it's often been said, many philosophers have said, really going all the way back to ancient Greece and before and to current times as well. The only place that we are truly free, that we truly understand what freedom is, is in our own mind, in our own thoughts. That is the place where we cannot be controlled in terms of what it is that we are thinking. And that's a powerful consideration to align with the God of mind and thought and intellect himself. It was Mercury who in many ways, not only through his ability to travel, but also through his wit, through his intelligence, his ability to sort of talk himself out of all kinds of circumstances and, and sticky moments even from his childhood onwards. You see how his mental dexterity ends up being a source of protection for him, especially as he navigated sometimes difficult terrains, as is the case when you're traveling between worlds and some of those worlds are friendlier than others. Now, of course, Venus is goddess of love and she had such a traction factor to her that her existence itself had her attracting all kinds of attention, showing up for her again and again. And it was a power that she was conscious of. She knew no matter where she went, no matter what she did, there would be people there who wanted to be in her presence, who wanted to know more about her, who wanted to connect with her, who wanted to truly know her energy and her spirit and her vitality, intimately so. She had the ability to have people fall in love with her everywhere she went, and gods fell in love with her as well. And so Venus actually had many, many, many lovers. So there are a lot of stories about this. Uh, she certainly was not, as much as she was a symbol of love, it, it's interesting that she was not a symbol of fidelity at all. <laughs> um, she enjoyed her life fully uh, and interacted with many people. And actually, she was one of Mercury's lovers, or we can say Mercury was one of her many, many lovers. There are hundreds of lovers documented uh, for Venus. And together they had a child. And that child was hermaphrodite. And that child carried very obvious masculine and feminine energies within it. And mythologically, or rather archetypally, we look at this figure and we understand how it represents wholeness or completion or really a sense of union, yes, but their union, the goddess of love, of attraction, and the god of mind and communication and intellectualization, as they come together, they create among themselves a being that is whole within itself, who carries truly balanced energies within it and is able to acknowledge and honor those energies as well. I recently had the great pleasure of interviewing Alice Sparkly Cat. Now, Alice is going to be speaking at the January 2023 speaker series at Synchronicity University. She actually caught my eye uh, way before. Um, she caught my eye with her work, her book called Post-Colonial Astrology. And she talks about how it is that astrology ultimately cannot be separated from its cultural context. And we also talked about um, how for so long the world has been understood in terms of duality. But when we look at certain indigenous cultures, especially before colonization and especially in places like the Americas, Australia, they understood that there are so many ways in which to understand the world and the universe and themselves as well. 
that it isn't just about what is masculine and feminine, but rather there was an understanding that we were able to express ourselves in all kinds of ways that moved beyond just these very distinct ways of understanding specific roles and only two roles at that. And, you know, as I was talking to her, I thought about a few different things. One of the things I thought about is how fortunate some of us are. I know I feel so fortunate that um, to live in a cultural context where you're able to acknowledge and honor this whole sense of emotional and intellectual expression that not too long ago was only limited to specific roles. It was one or the other, male or female, and male was intellectual, it was initiating, it was strong, and female was mothering, and it was receptive, and it was emotional. And it's interesting that this topic of conversation has been coming up so much, not only with Alice, but of course, the interview that I did recently with the great Stephen Forrest as well. We ended up talking about this also. And at least with Stephen Forrest, and we touched on this as well with Alice, and that interview will publish really soon, about how it is that Pluto in Aquarius and this Aquarian energy coming in, how that might continue to change things so that all of us are able to honor the variety of expression that we bring as whole human beings. I think back to, you know, the, the steps that got us here, the steps that have prepared us for Pluto and Aquarius. And that is something I'll be talking about a whole lot. And I've been talking about it for so many years as well. I'll link the decade ahead video uh, below so that you can review that as well. But um, it was Carl Jung that uh, talked about and described his principle of the animus for women and the anima for males. And essentially, it's this idea that for a person, and again, he's thinking more in terms of duality, but what Carl Jung said was that women have a part of their psyche that is masculine, and men have a part of their psyche that is feminine. And in order to truly become yourself, right, what he called individuation, to truly become a whole human being, you have to honor that within you that perhaps you think contrasts you. It is about understanding that we have this range of expression that isn't just about some assigned role, but rather we encompass all of it. All of us are able to cultivate self-knowledge and to act from that place. All of us are able to cultivate mind and intellect. In fact, we do see that in countries and cultures around the world, wherever it is that, you know, because countries have their own natal chart as well, just like we as human beings have our birth chart, so do countries, so do cities as well. And countries where they have a lot of air energy in the chart, they tend to be countries that prioritize things like education. And they also tend to be countries where we see a lot more equality among people. Um, there's a focus on moving beyond the barriers of our external identities so that people aren't just assigned specific roles based on gender, based on ethnicity, based on race, and so on. And so it's rather fascinating to think about how these ancient energies of Mercury and Venus ultimately come to encapsulate these ideas that we today are further exploring and further manifesting as well as part of becoming whole human beings. And so in this context, it was Hermaphrodite that represented a whole human being. Now, Hermaphrodite also had lots of lovers as well, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> And I find it so interesting that when you look at it astrologically, you know, Venus and Mercury are never far away from the sun. They're never more than two signs away from the sun. And they also are never really that far away from each other. They both move relatively quickly, though Mercury will, over the course of a year, a retrograde at least three times, sometimes four times. And so with Mercury sort of moving back and forth throughout the sky, He's going to connect with Venus again and again at key moments throughout any given year, as is the case with a week like this. And so if you remember last week, 
we ended the week with Mercury speaking in harmony with Neptune. And Neptune, of course, is an energy of dreams, of fantasy, of hope, of uh, just faith, plugging into source, seeing magic everywhere that you go. Imagination is powerful. Imagination is a force of healing, but it's often not recognized how imagination is a force of perseverance, how it is that imagination allows us to move through times that are challenging. And the truth is, if you live a full life, you are going to go through some periods that feel more challenging than others. It was Carl Jung who said, life is a series of crisis, chaos, calm crisis, chaos, calm. We are going to go through that cycle again and again as we move through our lifetime. And it is in the engagement of that cycle, the acceptance of that cycle, that we're truly able to benefit from it. And so that when that crisis comes, we don't lose something essential within us, especially those things that we've earned by moving through crisis, chaos, and calm at previous times. Each time makes us more resilient, makes us stronger. But of course, there are certain extreme examples as well. People who go through, you know, real hardships, um, not just personally, but we look at periods of time in history where uh, things took place that really were not very humane or just. How did people manage that? How did people navigate through that? Well, there have been many studies done in that regard, and they have found certain consistencies that do show up. And so one way in which people navigate through times of uh, injustice and cruelty is that they imagine that one day they're going to tell their story. Like that's something that they come to believe and in their minds as they're moving through really challenging times, they start to envision or conceptualize how and where they're going to tell their story, how what happened here in this moment is going to translate into some truth that they have to share and that there is a conviction that not only will they share it, but they're also envisioning it. They're imagining themselves in front of people speaking or they're imagining paper and themselves writing. And the other way in which people navigate through these challenging moments is that they imagine themselves talking to somebody. And so sometimes that can be a spouse or someone, you know, that you love on that level. Um, and so in their own minds, they will move through times of tremendous challenge and strength and even unfairness and injustice. And imagine that they're speaking to somebody who cares. You know, I shared a little bit before, uh, sometimes I edit it out when I say it, <laughs> um, you know, one of the big motivations behind what I do with my work is to give hope. And the reason is because when I was a teenager, I went through a very challenging period. There were lots of intense things happening in my chart at the time. I was very young and I just fell into such a depression at 14, um, right? And like for about two two and a half years or so, I fell into this really intense depression and I sort of couldn't function anymore is what happened. And, uh, you know, my parents bless them, but they just didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to help me. And back then, you know, there wasn't really an awareness or conversation around mental health. All I knew was that it was as if something within me really shut down. It was very hard. And I, as, as intellectual and nerdy as I can be, I couldn't even manage going to school. Like I just didn't even have that in me, which is, uh, you know, quite sad looking back because that was an environment that I really did excel in, but it became too challenging for me personally uh, to keep it up. And so I remember at that time, the few voices of hope, how much they helped me. And I knew from a young age that I wanted to be a voice of hope for other people. And so when I get emails, I get lots of emails, like almost every day, somebody says, wow, you really helped me. You helped me get through a really hard time. Three years ago, I was going through this and I watched your videos and that helped me. And that means so much to me because that is me living my intention. That's what I wanted from the go. But at the same time, in light of what we're talking about here, in light of this Neptunian energy that's with us, 
I remember in my own mind, and I recalled this so recently when I was looking at the sky and what's coming up, I literally would talk to Oprah Winfrey in my mind. <laughs> like this is, we're going way back here, right? But as a teenager and going through that really, really hard time and not even realizing what I'm doing. And I remember I would sit alone sometimes in my room and I would envision myself sitting next to Oprah Winfrey and she's talking to me and she's asking me questions and I'm telling her about my experiences and what I feel and what I went through um, and how I made it out. And it's so fascinating to me when I came across this understanding, these studies that had taken place um, and how people navigated through these tough times to see that that is something that I did, which I found rather fascinating. And so this week we do have on Wednesday, Venus speaking in harmony with Neptune as well. And then on Thursday, these two planets are going to meet in the sky. And so really it is like this whole swath of energy that's with us in the first part of the week. It's the imagination and the healing power of imagination that's with us. It is going to be once Mercury meets Venus, that mind and heart meet in the sky. It gives us a chance to take all that we are feeling, this heightened sense of uh, belief and faith and hope and idealism, and actually find a way to connect it. Not just a feeling, not just believing, but rather, how is it now that we can integrate that sense of faith into more areas of life? How can we bring it together so that mind and heart are actually embodied and living? Both these planets are in an earth sign right now. They're both in Capricorn. So it is about what you're actually living. Now, I would also add, you know, whenever I see a Venus in Capricorn, I think about how this represents a few different things. One is that it represents a focus on what we deserve, especially in the context of love. It is Capricorn that represents um, success. It represents status, but also respect as well. The respect that's earned by by creating oneself, aligning oneself with a higher legacy, knowing that you are on the pathway of creating that. Venus in Capricorn asks us to bring that sense of knowing that we deserve respect or we deserve certain basics from the people that we might bring our love to, from the people who might show up based on whom we attract. Well, we're still going to be discerning. That's part of Venus and Capricorn as well. The late, great Jonathan Kainer described Venus and Capricorn in birth charts, interestingly, as a fine wine gets better as it gets older, more beautiful as it gets older. And so I think that this represents a time, and especially with a week like this, um, with Venus and Mercury meeting in Capricorn and Neptune speaking to this configuration as well. It speaks to how we are coming to a depth of understanding um, within ourselves, certainly, but also as a collective as to what respect looks like and how are we going to articulate that? What does it mean to speak from heart, but also from a place of honoring? And where is it that certain hierarchies, because that's part of Capricornian energy, where is it that some of them bring structure in a way that strengthens us? But also, where is it that maybe it's time to reconsider some of those structures and some of those hierarchies as well? But here's the thing. It is this week that Mercury is standing still in the sky on Thursday going retro. So this whole week, well, we started feeling it last week as Mercury aligned with Neptune. This whole week, because Mercury is hanging out still in the sky, is still connecting with Neptune and will into next week as well. And so we see here the sense of magnification of dreamy energy. But we also see an opportunity to go within, to be still, to examine and to understand and to own all these different parts of us, all these sacred parts of us as well, and to look at this idea of what does it mean to have respect in love, yes, with Venus, but also for ourselves as well. Can we hold ourselves in high esteem? 
that may be part of the considerations that a lot of us are having now. But the energy of Capricorn also has to do with success and how we define it. The definition of success is so deeply personal to each of us. How are we going to understand that for yourself? Well, that is part of the exploration in a personal way that I think a lot of us are going to be considering. The other thing I do want to say is, you know, because Capricornian energy has to do with success, as I said, we often have symbols of success in any given time or context or culture. Mercury retrograde here is going to have us looking again at whether or not certain people truly are successful and how are we going to define their success and what does it actually mean to align with success if you don't have a sense of peace within yourself? If you're going around and round in your own mind where you can't even rest and you can't even be at peace within your soul or your psyche, then what is that success really? I think this is going to be part of the consideration. And not only because Mercury is going retrograde, but really the big event of all these big events taking place. We've got another huge event happening this week. And that happens at the end of the week with Pluto meeting Venus in the sky. Now, I said to you, think back, right? I started this video talking about this energy and I said, think back. It was the end of last year that we had Venus retrograde hand in hand with Pluto. This year now, it's Mercury retrograde in Capricorn as well. And yes, we are moving towards Venus conjunct Pluto throughout this week. If you are in the Americas, this energy takes place New Year's Eve night. Yes. And of course, later in the day in the rest of the world. But I find this so fascinating because I think a lot of us are going to be feeling this sense of yearning and longing and intensity and passion. As much as Capricorn can be an energy of holding back or understanding that everything has its time and wanting to see what other people are demonstrating before you act. As much as that can be there, Pluto kind of throws that all out the window, right? <laughs> Pluto is the factor that has you looking underneath the surface to see what's really going on. You know, the very famous myth of Persephone and um, how some stories conceptualized her as being dragged into the underworld by Hades, kidnapped from her mom, Demetra, who was the goddess of the seasons. As Demetra lost her daughter. She mourned. She no longer tended to the earth. And that is how the Greeks explained autumn and winter. And then the gods sort of negotiated a plan for Persephone to be with her mom half of the year. And when Persephone comes back to her mom, that is when uh, she's happy and spring comes and summer. Now, this idea of Persephone going to the underworld, I actually think and this is something I wrote about in um, Prayers to the Sky. But I actually think that, you know, a lot of cool stuff happens underground after hours. Um, I think about underground music, how there's this whole scene and people just love it. Underground parties. I know that that's a whole scene in just about every major city that you go to as well. There's a lot that goes on once the sun comes down that is rather alluring, especially if you've lived a life that otherwise has been very protective. And as is the case with this energy of Venus conjunct Pluto, I think that this is going to be an invitation for a lot of us to go underground, to go behind the scenes, to look at what's underneath the surface. What is our true desire? What are we wanting? And what are we pulled towards, even if our intellect is telling us something different? And where is it that we're challenging taboos as well? Pluto speaks to that also. Pluto meeting Venus, not only at the end of this year, connect to events that took place at the end of last year, but the events of last year are going to be understood differently in some way now. But I do think a lot of people, New Year's Eve parties are going to be happening. A lot of people are going to feel very tempted to go there, to see what's happening underground, behind the scenes, under the surface. They're going to be tempted to explore whatever their unique version of the underworld is. 
there is going to be a yearning for it, a strong desire for it at this time. Now, what I mean by yearning is I think that we as human beings have an inherent drive to learn about ourselves. And I think that emotion is the way that spiritual development happens, the awareness of one's emotions rather. It is those who feel things deeply that are going to live more fully. For every high, there is a low. And if you are a person who does go through periods of time where there may be emotional lows, it means that you also experience highs that enrich your life that much more. Of course, there are certain cases where that high and low is not taken on consciously uh, with intention and with a deliberate eye towards self-care as a spiritual practice along the way. And that is when highs and lows can become that much more extreme and not very healthy, not very good for a spiritual journey and a spiritual path. They lead to people doing things that after the fact they can feel really, really sad about really regretful about as well. That ability to be aware of it before you act from that place of creating pain in others is part of spiritual awareness and spiritual strength also. And so here we are. What does it mean for you to go underground? What it means for you to go to the underworld? That is a journey that's going to be uniquely your own. Now, often, of course, again, going back to these ancient mythologies, Greek mythology in particular, something that has fascinated me for a very long time. Um, we see this lust, right? We see this desire to go into the underworld or uh, underground is really about the exploration of desire. And that could be one way this energy is realized, but there are other ways as well. Reaching a level of personal honesty, personal truth, reaching a level of having enough love for ourselves to hold ourselves more fully as we acknowledge the truth of the situation. I was thinking about uh, something when I was looking at this Venus conjunct Pluto, um, and I thought about it in terms of love, of course, because this is Venus, goddess of love. But Venus isn't just about romantic love, right? If you think about Venus, she knew her worth. She didn't need to chase or go out there or make something happen because she knew that she alone was enough. That as she lived, as she was present, as she was true to herself, moments of love and passion and attraction and beauty would just show up for her. That is a state of faith that she held. But I was thinking about it in the context of this energy, because as much as we can talk about Pluto being lust and desire and all these wonderful things, which Pluto is, um, Pluto is often also speaking to uh, the kind of experiences that may feel unfair, that may feel unjust, that may feel like there are power struggles or power dynamics in them. And if that is the truth of a given situation you're in, that may show itself as well. You know, what makes the difference between um, someone who is able to understand what it means to hold love in themselves or not, right? And what I mean by that is, I truly believe that if it is that you are aware of the fact that you do have love for you, and I think that we don't give ourselves nearly enough credit for the self-love that we demonstrate in all kinds of ways, right? Getting up and taking a shower each day is an act of love for us to be able to do that. I don't want to get into things where people say, oh, I only shower three times a week. Showering every day is bad for you. <laughs> I'm sure that someone's going to say that in the comments if you want to have at it. But I mean, you know what I mean, right? Taking care of you, knowing you're worthy of that is an act of self-love, however it is that you intentionally do that. And the thing is that when it is that you can hold love for self with awareness, from that place, relationships transform profoundly. Relationships become 
ones of respect, where you are expecting respect and you give it in return. But also there's a sense of respect for agency as well. When it is that you hold love for you, it means that you can love another person that much more fully because you know that you also have enough for yourself because love is one of those things that is so abundant. And so as you meet other people or you're with somebody, maybe you fall in love with somebody and it's just so wonderful and it's just so amazing. And then that person, maybe they don't even know that you love them perhaps until you tell them, or maybe you've been with that person for a few months or a few years or longer. And it can happen that the person will then say to you that they either are not interested or no longer interested or just cannot love you the way in which you feel love for them. They cannot be present for you for whatever reason. I know that a lot of people have experienced moments of betrayal as well. And yes, it can really hurt. It can hurt when there's someone that you set intention on, that you had hope for, It can really hurt when it is that that person then is unable to meet us there. But see, here's the thing. There's a difference. When it is that you hold love for you, you're able to acknowledge that this person is an individual with their own agency, their own sense of purpose, their own sense of direction. And Yes, it's painful and it sucks and you're going to have to deal with it for a long time to come and maybe it affects trust issues for you or something. But the difference is that when it happens, that moment comes when someone says, my agency, my spirit, my life path is taking me in a different direction. If you hold love for you, then Even through the pain, you know on some level that you are going to be okay because you truly are. You know on some level that though this person may leave and though this symbol of love in your life and care in your life and hope in your life may leave, love is still there because that love is within you. And when you hold love for you, even if it's hard, and especially in the painful moments of life, it truly is from that place that you're able to love that much more. You're able to give love and receive love with greater depth and greater meaning, but also greater sensitivity and awareness as well. From that place of holding love within you, you don't possess anybody else. It's not about controlling anybody else or asking anybody else to be anyone other than whom it is that they are, because you know that you hold love for you as much as that romantic love can be so alluring, so intriguing. We don't want to let it go. Love, where it really matters, you have it, you own it, you hold it. And so you're going to be okay. I want to also mention, I saw a movie recently on Netflix. It's called White Tiger. It is an Indian movie, a Bollywood movie. I grew up watching Bollywood movies. (laughs) I remember them so much going to the Indian movie theater with my dad in particular, but my parents as a little girl. But White Tiger is a newer movie, right? And uh, I really enjoyed it. I ended up watching it. I, I was in Costa Rica when I saw it with a friend. And I watched it in Spanish, actually. So that was really interesting to me as well. But um, it was this uh, movie dubbed in Spanish for me, uh, White Tiger. It, it It's a movie about, and I, I don't want to give away anything, no spoilers here in that regard, but it's about somebody born into very dire circumstances, uh, very different and very... Um, disadvantage social location in their lives, uh, social demographic, and how this person transforms themselves and becomes something else. It is so archetypal, this story. It is so symbolic. It is so meaningful. And because of course it's me, I'm going to see all the archetypes, but 
it's also really enjoyable to watch. It doesn't have the dances and things like that, like some other big Bollywood movies are famous uh, for having. <laughs> it's, um, it's quite insightful. And so there's a quote in this movie. The movie had quite a few quotes, and so I might share another one in the future. But uh, one of the quotes in this movie that I really loved comes from a poet named Iqbal. And this quote, paraphrased, says that when it is that you are able to see beauty in the world, you are no longer a slave. So that's, that's a line from a poem by Iqbal. I've thought about this quite a bit and what this means, because there are so many ways, anytime you're looking at poetry, there's so many ways to interpret it. And that's why I think there are some people who say that astrology, practicing astrology is an act of poetry because you are imbuing these symbols in the sky uh, with meaning that can be interpreted in all kinds of ways as is the case with really powerful and beautiful poetry. And so I thought about these lines quite a bit. When you're able to recognize beauty in the world, you are no longer a slave. And I thought about what that means. And, you know, I'm brought back to what I shared earlier about mind and freedom. It is only in your mind that you are truly free. But even then, there are so many competing forces to direct your mind as well, to tell you, you know, who you are and what you should believe about yourself and the limits of your capability. We see all of this in the movie White Tiger. All of this, these themes show up as well. However, when your perception changes, then you're no longer just being led, but rather you are able to focus this power of freedom with intention. It can be hard, especially when we've been trained to, and maybe it's also evolutionary, uh, not evolutionary astrology. I mean, uh, it is a survival instinct of ours, right? To consider what our environments are telling us, to figure out how to survive in different environments. And given whatever social location we are in, there absolutely are times to listen that are important, that are valuable. Um, but when it is that we intentionally decide that we are going to see beauty, no matter what, we know real freedom then. And I think it's when moments are painful, moments are tough, moments challenge us, especially emotionally challenge us. There's a stimuli, there's a person, we're attracted, we're drawn, there's rejection, there's uncertainty, there's a sense of, okay, you love me, but I am no longer going to love you. These are painful experiences. And painful experiences sometimes can feel all-consuming, as is the case with Pluto conjunct Venus. Pluto comes along and can feel all-consuming of love in particular, of our expression of love, our yearning for love can feel all consuming. And yet it is by being willing to, even in the midst of what is challenging, see the beauty in what may be taking place, see the beauty within ourselves. And seeing beauty within ourselves means to hold love, to hold love within ourselves. Well, that becomes a moment of true freedom. It doesn't mean that we turn off a switch and we're no longer sad or no longer learning through some difficult experiences and emotion. But it does mean that we are no longer just automatically told how to feel about them by larger forces or societal forces or our conditioning, but rather through our own intention to see beauty, we become that much more free. What I love about this week for us, there's so much here. It is a powerful and meaningful astrological moment. And there's so much here. It is such a meaningful time. I know we've got all this energy in Capricorn right now, but next week, Venus will move into Aquarius. A couple of weeks after that, Sun will move into Aquarius. So the energy is going to change as it does, of course, it always does. It's always evolving. It's always moving. 
Um, but what is remarkable about what is happening right now is how it mirrors and reflects what some of our learning might have been a year ago. Wherever we were in love a year ago, now we may see it differently. Wherever we were in terms of acknowledging our own beauty and our ability to focus on beauty, we may see that differently as well. Each of the planets is a part of your soul. Each of the planets wants to be acknowledged and honored. And you're going to find your own unique ways to do that. And I think a part of that includes, of course, understanding the force of regeneration and reinvention and remix, right? Understanding that force is very Plutonian. And transforming from a deep place of understanding of knowing that it's not just a superficial change, but something within you, you've actually turned over. You've looked at the underbelly and you know that you're going to be okay is a tremendous source of authenticity. That's how we truly become ourselves and the best version of ourselves as well. But we also have a need to recognize beauty within ourselves, within our world. That's Venus. We all have Venus in our chart in one way or another. And so where will you now, having looked at what is in the underbelly, what is undesirable, what is messy, what is taboo, what you have rejected before, how is it now that you still are going to see beauty within yourself and you still are going to hold love within you? Well, that is a journey. But it is at a time like this that our pathway towards understanding this and holding that love and knowing that you are worthy of holding that love within you, well, that accelerates now. It really starts to become a conviction that takes roots and transforms us as part of a brand new pathway, a brand new journey, and a brand new year ahead. Well, thank you so much for watching. What do you love about this week? Let me know in the comments below. I love reading you guys. And to prove it to you, here are some of my most recent favorite comments. I want to say the comments meant so much to me. I actually was moved to tears by reading some of these comments uh, from this last week. And I just want to thank you so much with all my heart for all the love and positive energy that you bring into my life. Uh, you know, right about now, I'm going to tell you, hit the notification bell and like and subscribe and share. And of course, there is Superstar where you can get expanded exclusive video scopes each week for each sign. For as low as just $3 a month with choose your membership rate, there are higher tiers as well. All of those links are below. So that's what I know I have to say to you. But what I want to say to you as well is that I am so grateful. I am grateful. Um in ways in which I uh, don't often get to express to you. But I shared a video recently on my Instagram and this video, I called it the year of the remix. It was my year in review. And I thought about how um, when I started this year, I was so sad. I was very disillusioned. Um, I had met somebody. It was like a dream come true for the first months. And then it really, really wasn't. It became very Venus conjunct Pluto in a very messy way. And it hurt a lot. It hurt a lot to pour so much of myself uh, in hope that it would be, it would work. And it was not meant to be. It was not to work. And it was very reminiscent of the relationship I'd gotten out of a year earlier where for years, I'd poured so much of myself into it. And by the time I left, I was just so sad and so tired. And in many ways, that's how I started this year off in that state. And as I moved through this year, I have slowly but surely moved into this year of a remix of huge changes, but also really important experiences that will stay with me for the rest of my life. And it is not lost on me that um, these experiences are possible because of your love, because of your trust, because of you seeing me as some part of your sacred journey. I literally have had the world open up to me in so many ways, my inner worlds and outer worlds as well. 
And that has allowed me to move through some really powerful healing moments this year. I know that life is a journey and the soul continues to evolve. And I'm in no way saying that I have reached nirvana, <laughs> that I am ready to ascend at all. I feel very strongly that I have a lot more to do in this lifetime. I've always said I want to live to 150. I was joking with my friend, uh, Frank uh, Clifford, very renowned astrologer that you've seen on my channel before. I was saying to this to him and he was saying, oh, you want to live to your Neptune return because the Neptune return happens at 160. And I said, yeah, that about sounds right. So I know I have a lot more to do. And that means a lot more personal and spiritual growth to go through and emotions that I'll go through as well. But being here uh, every week with you has been a spiritual practice and it's been a spiritual anchor to me again and again since I've been here on YouTube uh, for so, so many years. And so I just want to take this moment at this time of year as we're finishing a year to say thank you for that. Just thank you. Whatever it is that you see in me, whatever role I play, whether it's watching me on YouTube and you're good with that, hitting the thumbs up uh, from time to time and you're good with that, commenting from time to time or not, being a superstar uh, on my superstar site or not, being a student at Synchronicity University or not, regardless, my gratitude has my heart feeling so full and I just thank you. Thank you for being a part of this incredibly important year for me and I look forward to sharing even more incredibly important years ahead. Synchronicity University presents some truly incredible programs and there are literal days left to choose your tuition rate as low as just $5 a class, an unheard of rate for programs of this quality. You've got to join. You'll absolutely love it. Expand your horizons. Take some astrology classes. Learn more about yourself and your chart and so much more. Change your life with a brand new year with these incredible teachers that are coming to Synchronicity University. Let's start with the one and only Cameron Allen. Cameron Allen is back. He's one of our more popular teachers and he's going to be teaching a course on medical astrology as only he can. Uh, this is a course that's going to have a lot of practical things in it. So just like you saw in the interview that I had with him, he talked about working with elements in your chart. So if you've got a lot of fire, how to work with that. If you've got a lack of fire signs and fire element in your chart, how to work with that. And each of the elements, air and water and earth. And you saw how in that interview, how practical it actually is. It's about embodying these energies in such a practical way. And he is, of course, a herbalist as well. He's going to be teaching you about that. And so this is really an, an event, I would say, that is not to be missed. Learning from the one and only Cameron Allen and learning in a way that is so applicable, so accessible, where you see your chart differently, you see the medicine that your chart is pointing to, and you're able to help yourself and implement it so that you can experience even better health. I think that this is a great course to take now because a lot of people are focused on health uh, with a year like this. And so, yeah, it can be pretty incredible um, to actually embrace that understanding of taking the best of care of you and how your astrology chart can help you to understand what that means uniquely to you as well. Cameron Allen will show the way. So again, we've literally got just days left to choose your tuition rate as low as just $5 a class, an unheard of rate to learn from the one and only Cameron Allen at synchronicityuniversity.com. Learn more and sign up. Links are in the description below. Synchronicity University presents an incredible speaker series. And right now, just a few days left to choose your tuition rate as low as just $5 a class. Check out these incredible astrologers who are going to be here. I'm going to start with our big dog astrologer for this series, it is the one and only Christine Skinner. Christine is a prolific writer in financial astrology. That is her expertise. That is where she has focused her career and written so many books on. One of her very important books is on the financial universe in your astrology chart. I had a chance to interview her and you saw how brilliant this woman is. So Really, just for her, it would be a good idea to take this course. And yet, it is this speaker series that has so many other astrologers as well. 
So yes, Christine Skinner is our big dog for this series. Another very important astrologer as well is Wade Caves. Wade is amazing. He's been making a splash where it comes to hoary astrology. Now, hoary astrology is using astrology to answer specific questions as divination. And this is a topic that a lot of students have asked for over the last couple of years. And finally, we have one of the best in the field teaching at Synchronicity University on hoary astrology as well. And so check out Wade Caves. He's going to be helping us to learn uh, about some basic principles of hoary astrology. I mentioned earlier Alice Sparkly Cat, and she is going to be teaching on Venus and Pisces. So when her course happens, it's going to be when Venus is in Pisces. And this is where Venus is at her best. She really is able to bring forward qualities that she loves. And this is a class that's very experiential. And so it's very much about you going through exercises and understanding your connection to Venus when she is so powerful and when she is so strong. And you'll be guided as only Alice can guide you. Taylor Schuler, award-winning astrologer and so many of you saw my interview with her and you just saw how brilliant she is. I mean, she really is this person who's like on the precipice of really, really breaking out and being a huge star in astrology. Like, I feel that from her so strongly. I sort of met her in passing at the recent ESAR conference in August in Colorado, and I felt that energy from her. And just to talk to her, that conviction magnified that much more. And so she's going to be teaching on Saturn in Pisces, a topic that a lot of people are looking at and looking forward to. This is all about turning dreams into reality. She's going to help us to understand this, but also she's going to personalize it so that you're able to connect it to your own astrology chart as well to get a look into what that move of Saturn could mean for you that much more personally. And then we have Robina Kodadin, and Robina is going to be talking about how the South Node and the North Node, how they pull on each other, how we go back and forth from the two. And so I think that's going to be a fascinating class as well. So I hope that you will join us for the January speaker series at Synchronicity University. You've got just a few days left to choose your tuition rate as low as just $5 a class. And so as you can see, this is an incredible series to take as you start a brand new year. I mean, you're already getting your health right, thanks to Cameron Allen. But with Christine, you'll get your money right. Um, with Taylor Schuler, you're understanding how to turn your dreams into reality. Uh, with Alice Sparkly Cat, you are learning about love and so much more. Every single one of these teachers is bringing skills to help you to understand how to make this year that much more empowered and that much more better. So again, as always, just $5 a class, just a few more days to choose your tuition rate. You can learn more and sign up now at synchronicityuniversity.com. Synchronicity University presents one of our most popular and beloved teachers. It is Mark Lawrenson, and he is back at Synchronicity University teaching a five-week course on the lunar nodes in your chart and in astrology. These are placements that speak very strongly to past lives and future lives and the lessons you came into this life with and the lessons you're moving towards and how to move towards what I like to call greater love and greater wisdom and so much more. I, of course, did interview Mark. And in that uh, particular interview, we talked about the South Node through the signs. And so you can watch that and just get a little bit of a taste of how incredible he really is in terms of his understanding of the nodes and so much more. He is the principal of the Sydney Astrology School. He is a master teacher. And when he taught his class before, I remember how many students said that that was a class that they felt so profoundly that changed them so deeply. He really does bring a soul-centered approach to chart interpretation. And for this class, a five-week course on understanding the nodes in your chart, well, that's just phenomenal. This is a course that I know a lot of people have already signed up for. The more the merrier, and it really does create this incredible energy uh, moving forward from here to understand your soul's purpose and to see your chart with that much more love and wisdom as well. 
This is Mark Lawrence's specialty. I hope that you will join us as low as just $5 a class, an unheard of rate to learn from the one and only Mark Lawrence. He himself can't believe like the courses he teaches at his own school and other places. It's never at that rate, but I'm very proud of the fact that Synchronicity University can offer some of the most incredible astrologers on the planet at such an accessible rate so that more and more people can get quality astrology lessons and courses. Um, I love being a part of that. And so Mark Lawrenson, he embodies the best of that opportunity and potential. I hope you will join us. You can learn a lot more about his course and sign up now at synchronicityuniversity.com. Links are in the description below. Thank you again. Thank you so much for this moment with you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for an incredible year, another year walking this journey with you. I am filled with gratitude. I'm filled with love. And I'm so humbled as well that you see me as part of your spiritual path. Thank you. Thank you for that sincerely and fully. I'm sending you so much love. I hope everybody has an incredible holiday season, if that's what it is, where you are in the world, um, but also in your heart as well. I hope you experience absolute love and joy and wisdom in whatever way it finds you now. Thank you. Thank you again for watching. It'll be a great week. Enjoy.